Hello and welcome again to another video in Introductory Statistics. This video we are covering probability. Probability is definitely one of the most challenging topics in the entire course. Um, a lot of students will struggle a little bit more with hypothesis testing and confidence intervals on the actual exams, uh, but there are a great number of students who tell me that this chapter uh, this topic has been the one that gave them the most frustration. Uh, so we will cover techniques, especially at the end of the video, that will hopefully help with that frustration, um, help uh, alleviate most of that frustration to tell you a way that you can solve almost every single probability problem that you will encounter using the methods that we'll talk about at the end of the video that's catered just for this particular topic. Um, always for this video be ready with your formula card. Um, that will be enormously helpful in this chapter. We'll talk a lot about using the formulas that are on your formula card under the probability section. Uh, the second thing you'll use is your calculator. It's mostly just for arithmetic. We do have one calculator function. It's really a chapter 4 calculator function um, that's uh, not as catered to this topic as it is to future topics, but we will use it in this chapter anyway. Um, and then have your lecture notes handy, your printed out lecture notes, so you can take notes on top of those lecture notes and uh, use those notes in your homework and your quizzes. And uh, so let's talk about the sample space to begin with. The um, sample space and events inside the sample space are very much like the population and the sample. Um, so the sample space is the entire space, um, and this rectangle represents uh, the sample space from the Venn diagram. And so the sample space is everything that is possible in your scenario that you're looking at. So every possible outcome is going to be part of your sample space. And uh, then the event, we use circles, we use rectangles for the entire sample space and we use circles in the Venn diagram for events. So here we have event A and event B uh, and they're represented by circles. And those are subsets of the sample space, and they you can choose how you're going to define them. And it could be that an event just has like one single outcome, or it could be an entire group of outcomes, uh, but it usually is some sort of subset of, it always is some sort of subset of the sample space. Uh, here, this almond shape is going to represent both A and B, and we'll talk about that a little bit in a little bit. Uh, and so that is the sample space, and then here's another way that we can represent the sample space, and that is a probability distribution. Now, remember, previously we talked about frequency distributions and relative frequency distributions using proportions or percentages, but I specifically want to talk about proportions. So with a relative frequency distribution, you could have a column for the variable and a column for proportions. And I consider the probability distribution to be enormously like the, uh, the proportions distribution because our two things that have to be true uh, for probability distributions, that all the probabilities have to be between 0 and 1. Um, that was true of proportions too. Proportions always have to be between 0 and 1. And then the sum of all the proportions always had to be 1. Uh, and that's true uh, here too of probability distributions. If we were to add up the probability column, we should always get 1. Now it might be that rounding error would give us 0.99 or 1.01, 1 .01, uh, but if we didn't have any rounding error, if we did fractions instead of decimals and we always gave the exact value of the fraction, then we should always get exactly 1. So only rounding error is the reason that we might not get 1. Uh, this is kind of a special probability distribution here in that uh, it just kind of lumps the last category together. So 4 plus, it could be having 4 cars, or it could be um, some crazy guy who has like 10 cars or something like that. Maybe he's not crazy. Maybe he actually owns an auto repair shop, and that's why he has so many vehicles. So, um, But uh, regardless, we're going to pretend that that 4 plus is uh, the average of, so we'll say maybe 4.5. 
Uh, and what we're going to do is something that you will be asked to do in the homework for this section. Uh, so you will be asked the expected value, and the, that's going to be the value that you expect to get on average. So um, if you are asked the expected value, uh, then there is a kind of neat little trick that you can do. Um, so expected value. Sorry, it takes me so long to write. And then my handwriting's not even that good. I should have typed this. Um, so, uh, to compute the expected value, what uh, Newton will tell you is to multiply the outcomes times the probabilities. So you would kind of have a third column for 0 times 0 0.03, which is 0, and 1 times 0 0.13, which is 1, and then 2 times 0 0.7, which is 1.4, and then 3 times 0 0.1, which is 0 0.3. Um, and then you would, of course, have to and you may not have any of these in Newton where you have to guess. If you do, though, Newton will tell you what to guess. It, you, you won't actually be guessing. So here, I'm going to tell you that we're going to assume this average is 4.5. And so we're going to use 4.5 here and multiply that by 4. And then what you would do is add up all those products together. Uh, there's actually the formula for that is to multiply the x column. This is your x column and uh, multiply the p of x column, that just means the probability. Um, so this column is your p of x, and what the of x means is basically saying that the probability when x is zero, so you would write um, p zero here, uh, and so that's why we have the um, p of x. So p of zero is 0.3, whereas p of one would be 0.13, and p of two would be 0 0.70, and p of three would be 0 0.10, and so on and so forth. But the easier way to do that is the way we're going to do it, um, and that's to put all of this into L1. So this column's going to go into L1. We're going to put 4.5 here for this one because we can't put 4 plus. Um, and all of our probabilities will go into L2, and then we'll do one bar stats and tell it to consider L2. Um, and ironically, it calls this the list. Uh, well, maybe not ironically. Um, interestingly, uh, this is our list, and this is our frequency list, or relative frequency list, um, because remember, probabilities are like proportions, and so this will work out nicely for us. Uh, okay, we'll go ahead and discard. Um, the stat edit, I've already put the stuff in here for us, so um, if we hadn't had the stuff in here, we could highlight with our cursor and do clear and enter, but I, I don't want to do that. Um, 0, 1, 2, 3, and then 4.5, um, so I'm double checking my list to make sure it's right, and then double checking my probabilities, 0 0.03, 0 0.13, 0 0.7, or you, if you type 0 0.70, it'll change it to 0 0.7, 0 0.1, and 0 0.04. So double checking the data, which is always important. And then it tells us, you know, on the formula card under Chapter 4, stat calc, one var stats. We already have L1, um, and then of course the L2 is in blue, so we'll do second L2, and then calculate. The mean is equal to the expected value. It even says mean here. Um, on the formula card. And when we actually get into chapter four, you may be asked to do the standard deviation as well. Um, and of course, the standard deviation is right here. Uh, we'll use the population standard deviation because this is an entire population, the entire sample space. Uh, so we're using um, x bar because that's the same thing as mu, um, but we'll use sigma if in chapter four when we get there to do uh, the standard deviation. But here, we'll, in this in this chapter, in the probability chapter, we're only asked for the expected value. The expected value is the mean of the probability distribution. And so that's our very first output when we do one bar stats with L1 and L2. And so that's how you do those sorts of problems. They're probably going to be the last that you encounter, though. Um, let's start with uh, now, the very basic definition of probability, uh, we've already jumped into some probability questions, but this is the first formula on your formula card under the probability section, and it says look at 
the number of outcomes in the event that you're trying to find the probability of, and then your denominator is the total number of outcomes in the entire sample space. Uh, so here, if we were to count, uh, these are marbles in a bag, if we were to count the number of marbles in the bag, uh, we would see that we have six blue, well, I'm sorry, six instead of nine blue marbles, um, and then nine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, of the red and then five of the green for a total of 20 marbles. And then if we wanted to find the probability of blue, that would be six out of 20 because we have um, one, two, three, four, five, six blue. Uh, and we just counted that there were 20 total marbles. And so that probability of being blue, if we were to shuffle the marbles in the bag, and then pull out a marble, the probability we would get blue would be 0.3. Uh, and then we could do the same thing for red. Red is 9, and we could do the same thing for green, green being 5, um, and we would get the probability of blue, the probability of red, and the probability of green, which should all add together to be 1, because that's the whole sample space. And so that's the very simple definition of probability, what it means to be probability. And we'll use this formula often, often, often. Uh, and then other ideas and concepts in the probability chapter is the idea of or. And this is usually a little bit counterintuitive for students. So to discuss or, or is this one, when we say it could be A or B, we mean that it could be A, or it could be B, or it could be both A and B at the same time. So if I say uh, that you need to take chemistry or physics, you could fulfill that by taking just chemistry, you could fulfill that by taking just physics, or you could fulfill that by taking both chemistry and physics. When we say both, um, when we say and, I guess I should say, um, the ampersand representing the word and, uh, it has to be both. If we say you need to take chemistry and physics, you really have to take both of them in order to be in that description of chemistry and physics. And if I say you can take any class you want to except for physics, um, then what I'm saying, or except for chemistry, I guess I would say, because I've been using chemistry as A, um, then as long as you do not take uh, chemistry, any class that isn't chemistry, it could be physics, um, it could be statistics, it could be English, it could be Latin dancing, um, it could be any class underwater basket weaving, it could be any class that you want, to take except for chemistry. Um, so that's called the complement. It's uh, kind of, I think of it as the opposite, the complement, the opposite, the exact opposite. Um, some will represent it by the letter C for complement. We will represent it by a, an apostrophe. So whenever you see A apostrophe, that means it's the complement, it's the thing that's not an A. Um, it's also called A naught. So you'll hear some professors, some classes, some textbooks call it A naught because it's literally the thing that's not in A. Uh, and so we see all of these represented on our formula card. Whenever you read the word or in a problem, especially if it's asking you to find the probability of this or that, then that means you want to use the addition rule um, because that uses the word or. Whenever you see the word and, you want to use the multiplication rule. Uh, specifically, this multiplication rule is always true. Um, this multiplication rule, this first one, uh, comes with a huge caveat in that you're only allowed to use this one if you know that A and B are independent. So if you don't know, if you aren't told in the problem that A and B are independent, you are not allowed to do this one. So that's very, very, very important. Uh, as a matter of fact, on your formula card, you may want to highlight this one so that you pay more attention to this bottom one and less attention to this one because you're only allowed to use this one if you know for certain 
that A and B are independent. There are lots of things that are naturally independent, like um, if you're uh, tossing a coin twice, the first toss does not affect the second toss, and so those are naturally independent things. If you're drawing a card from a deck of cards and you're replacing that card each time and shuffling the deck, then the draws are independent of each other. If you are rolling dice, uh, then one dice is independent of the other. Um, if you're rolling a single die multiple times, then each roll is independent of the other. So there are lots of things that are naturally independent, um, but if it's a complicated situation, uh, you need to be told that it's independent before you just assume that it's independent. So uh, be sure to look for that. Uh, and then we have the complement that we just talked about. So um, the complement is right here, and it says complement right here. Um, by the way, these are called the multiplication rules, um, and so be sure to use this one instead of this one. Uh, and so here we are with, with lots of the formulas on the formula card. Uh, we discussed this one already, and so this is this one and this one. We haven't touched conditional probability and independence test yet. We're about to do that, um, and the multiplication rule. So uh, the complement, we have talked about the complement, but we haven't talked about where the formula itself comes from. And so the formula itself comes from the idea that if you have A and you have everything that's not an A, remember our very first two rules for probability distributions said that the sum of the entire sample space had to be 1. Well, that means that the probability of A plus the probability of not an A, and of course this AC is the same thing as our A apostrophe. Um, so the probability of A plus the probability of not an A has to be 1. And then we can just use algebra to move um, either a complement or a to the other side. We would only move one of them to the other side. We wouldn't move both of them to the other side. And so the probability of a has to be equal to 1 minus the probability of not an a. Um, and likewise, the probability of not and A is equal to 1 minus the probability of A, and that is exactly like it is on the formula card. So that's where this formula comes from. And then uh, to talk about the, before we talk about the addition rule, we want to talk about disjoint events because there's a general addition rule and there's a specific addition rule. Um, and they're kind of the same, but in order to understand that, we need to understand what it means to be disjoint. Uh, there is another word for disjoint that you might see sometimes. It's called mutually exclusive. Um, both disjoint and mutually exclusive mean that they're completely separate. In this scenario, I'm envisioning what if you were in a high school uh, calculus class. Um, so you only got maybe uh, eight students in that calculus class. And everybody in that calculus class is going to go live in the dorms next year. Um, they're going to go off to their um, three different schools because uh, they're in Clarksville. So, of course, Austin P is a major choice. Uh, MTSU, being also in Middle Tennessee, not too far from us, is a major choice. And then uh, I chose Tennessee Tech because it's my alma mater, and that's where my eldest is going off to in just weeks from now. Um, and so uh, you wouldn't, if you're, if you were going off to the school and living in the dorms and attending the, the university full time though, you wouldn't go to two schools. Um, you, you would go to just one school. And so there isn't going to be overlap between those who are living in the dorms at Austin P and those who are living in the dorms at Tennessee Tech um, or those who are living in the dorms at MTSU. You're going to choose one of those places if you're going to live on campus and be a full-time, first-time freshman student. And so these, the way we've defined them, are all disjoint events. They are all completely separate. There's no overlap. There's no student who is going to be living at Austin P and living at Tennessee Tech in their doors. So whenever anything's completely separated, there's no possibility of any overlap in common. Uh, that's called a disjoint event. And so here we're, here's our addition rule. It's just like this version is just like it is on the formula card. And the picture helps explain why the probability is the formula that it is. So if we look at the yellow, that's our probability of A. So all of A 
is our yellow. So if we're looking at the probability of A or B, remember that's the probability of A or the probability of B or the probability of both. So we should include all three of these sections. Well, um, our yellow includes um, this section and this section. Um, and then, of course, you know, if we have our three check marks, our blue includes this section and this section. But we've counted the almond shape in the middle, um, which is now here labeled in green. We've counted this twice, and we only want to count it once. So this section plus this section plus this section is what we really want. Um, and we've counted the green twice, so we subtract it off once. Um, so this counts the almond shape in the middle, and this counts the almond shape in the middle. Um, so we subtract it off once so that we're only counting the green almond shape one time. Uh, and then we don't have to worry about the almond shape at all if we've got disjoint events because the almond shape will be zero. If they are really disjoint events, there is no overlap, and so we could subtract off zero. Um, but if we are subtracting off zero in the case of disjoint events, um, that's not going to change anything. So uh, there is an abbreviated formula for disjoint events. I didn't put that on the formula card because you can just use this formula and know that if it's disjoint, this is going to be zero. Uh, so that's the union, and remember the union is the word or. The intersection is the word and. So we talk about union and intersection, um, which we don't do that often. We usually just say the word or and say the word and. But um, or is the union, this or that, or both. Um, and and is only the both. And then the last area of the formula card for probability that we want to talk about is this conditional probability. And whenever we see the vertical line, that represents conditional probability. And the conditional probability always follows this formula. As soon as you hear the word given that, or um, that's our big, big clue, given the given condition. Um, the given condition is always the second one. So this bar would read A given B, or A given that B has happened, given that B has already occurred. Uh, it actually says that up here too, so the probability of A given that B has already occurred. So B always becomes our denominator in that case. The given condition is always our denominator, and then the overlap between the probability that we're looking for and our given condition, it has to be both, is going to be our numerator. Um, and we don't have to memorize that, it's on our formula card for us. So we just look at our formula card and we can find out what um, the formula is. So uh, this is a, a really nice picture of conditional probability. So um, notice that the green almond shape is already in B, so it's always going to follow our rules of probability and that the most this numerator can be would be all of event B um, because it's it's the overlap um, so if if B were a subset of A um, then this could be a probability of 1 in other words um, but it normally you're not going to have B be a subset of A B will be larger than just this green almond shape and so you're going to have something that's less than 1 but zero or more as well. So um, if A and B were disjoint events, so if, there, if this was A and this was B, and they were completely separate and there was no overlap, then the numerator um, and part would be zero. Um, so the probability of A and B, well, that couldn't happen, so that would be completely zero. And in that case, you would have the probability of the condition, given conditional probability, would also be zero because it'd be zero over whatever the probability of B is. Um, so your conditional probability would be zero in that case. Uh, so uh, we also want to talk about independence tests. Now that we have uh, conditional probability under our belt, there are three independence tests. I only have two listed on your formula card though because if you look at these first two, um, they're exactly the same. So 
What we decide to call A, event A, and what we decide to call B is completely arbitrary. I usually don't use the letters A and B. I usually use um, letters that make the most sense in the problem. Uh, so if, for instance, we're dealing with red and yellow, I would use R and Y. Um, so A and B, you could say let A be B and let B be A, and if you did that, um, every where you see A, put B, and everywhere you see B, put A, um, and everywhere you see A, put B, like we said at first, um, then this formula becomes this formula. So this second formula is just a repetition of the first, swapping the letters out. Uh, and then this last formula, if we did the probability of A given B, that's supposed to be an A, sorry, if we did the probability of A given B, um, then this would be our general multiplication rule, the multiplication rule that's always true. Um, uh, if we used, instead of P of A, we use P of A given B. Then, uh, looking on your formula card, the multiplication rule, the second one, the one that's always true, um, A given B times B. Uh, so what we're saying here is that P of A given B is equal to P of A, and that's really just our first rule. So really all three of these rules are saying exactly the same thing. If one of these rules is true, if one of them is met, then all three are met, and so you don't need to do all three, you just need to do one of them. So any one of these is considered an independence test. And if both sides of the equation, so basically what you would do is you would find this side of the equation, and then you would find this side of the equation, and if they are actually exactly equal, uh, then you say, yes, we do have independence. So we know that these two events, A and B, are independent of each other. Um, and again, when one of them is true, all three of them are true. And so that's all we need to do uh, for an independence test. And then if we're told events are independent, we can use any of these and know that they will be true. And so that's our formula card. So we've got the definition of probability, we've got the formula for the complement, we've got the formula for when we are asked to find or, um, and this of course is the formula for when we're asked to find not. Um, the complement formula is actually valuable in more ways than when you're explicitly asked to find that it's not in a category. For instance, sometimes uh, when you're told that you're going to have 99 test questions and you want to find the probability of getting all of the questions um, or not getting all of the questions right or, or something like that. Sometimes it's easier to find the complement. When a question gets too hard, think, hey, what if I found the complement? What if I found exactly the opposite? Is that a much easier question to answer if I found exactly the opposite? So you could do that and you could subtract that from one because we know that the complement of something and the original something have to add together to be one. So sometimes uh, finding the complement and then subtracting that complement from one will help you answer a question more easily. Uh, we've talked about conditional probability. Um, you find the probability of both and, and divide it by the given condition, whatever that is. Uh, we've talked about the independence tests and we've talked about the multiplication rules, particularly how this is the real generalized multiplication rule and this one we're only allowed to use if we are absolutely certain, if we've been told, or if um, we're absolutely certain that A and B are independent. Um, and then this uh, special stat calc one bar stats L1, L2 is helpful whenever we're asked for the mean, which is the expected value. I'm just going to abbreviate it here as EV. So uh, we will use the formula card a lot. Um, that's definitely one of the rules of my techniques. Uh, so basically, this is a layout of five steps to work any probability problem. And if you're doing all of these steps, um, this will help you tremendously. So the first step is to write the answer that's being requested, write what the problem's looking for in probability notation. So if it's asking you, um, what's the probability that in your sack lunch you got an apple? Uh, then you might say, hey, that I'm going to do probability of A as probability of getting an apple. Um, and then, likewise, everything that's given to you, all of the information that's given to you from the problem, you're going to write it in probability notation as well. Um, so you have all the information that you're given, and then you have all the information that you want to find out. Those two things help you do step three, 
Um, so step three is to consider each and every formula on the formula card, especially the complement and especially the multiplication rule, and say, are these useful in getting me from what I'm given to what um, I need to know? So uh, with you'll look back on the formula card um, and you'll you'll look at every single question that you're given on the formula or every single formula that you have on the formula card um, and you'll say okay this is the thing I'm asked for and I know this this and this so obviously the addition rule is the one I should use or if you are asked to find this um, and you uh, know this but maybe you don't know this um, but you look down here and here's the formula for this um, or here's the formula for this and you happen to be told that they are independent um, then you're like okay now I know everything that I need to know um, so you're going to mix and match these um, particularly looking for what you're asked for number one um, for what the question is asking you to get um, and see which formulas you can use to get there uh, and then uh, be prepared, and I've already talked about that a little bit when looking at the formula card, be prepared to use multiple formulas. There's absolutely no guarantee that you'll only need one of the formulas. I think that's one of the reasons students get so hung up is because uh, they're presented with complicated problems that require them not to just use one formula but to use several different formulas. Uh, and if all of that fails and if it gets too complicated, uh, the draw a picture. The tree diagram is my favorite and that's what we're about to do an example of. Um, but the Venn diagram is also helpful. The Venn diagram was um, like the picture of the sample space being the rectangle and your events being circles. Uh, when you draw the Venn diagram it's it's helpful to start from the outside in. So with the Venn diagram you'll have your squares, the sample space, and you'll have event A and event B, um, but start with the inside stuff. So start by labeling the, the very overlap inside stuff and then labeling just A that's not the overlap and just B that's not the overlap and then lastly um, kind of deduce. So if you know all of A and you know the overlap then you can subtract off to find this part. That's why it helps to start with the inside stuff. Um, so, but we're, we're not going to really talk about the Venn diagram. I bet that the textbook or Newton instruction talks about the Venn diagram. We're going to focus on the tree diagram because I find the tree diagram to be even more helpful than the Venn diagram. Uh, if you can accurately draw, if you're given enough information in the problem so that you can accurately draw a complete tree diagram, then you can answer any question that that is asked of you in that scenario. Any, any question. Um, just by adding up all of the outcomes, uh, the probabilities of each of the outcomes that is being requested in the answer. So identifying everything that is in A and adding up all of those probabilities of the outcomes that are in A. Um, and so let's do that. We will do that for uh, one of the questions. First let's talk about trees a little bit because I, I haven't shown you a tree. This is a tree diagram. I prefer my trees to be laid on their sides like this one is here so um, it will keep growing in this direction instead of a, a rotated 90 degree clockwise um, which the tree is standing upright. Uh, so we um, here the the first trial will always be represented on the left hand side and then we'll go to the right to represent the second trial and if we did a third draw so here we have two marbles and we're drawing them out of a bag so if we did a third trial or a third draw um, of a third marble to keep with us uh, then that would be right here so um, each of these like columns I guess you could say uh, represents a draw and then how many branches you have coming out of any particular node um, will represent the number of options. So here we only have two different colors of marbles. We have green marbles and we have blue marbles. But we could have red marbles in the bag, we could have yellow marbles in the bag. If we had four options, then we would have four different lines coming out of our first draw and we would have four different lines most likely coming out of our second draw as well. Um, so the first thing is the trials. Those are going to be like um, the great big huge columns are going to represent your 
your trials, um, or is here the number of draws, and then the second thing you have are options and how many options you have coming out of each particular node, um, how many branches you have coming out, will correspond to the number of options, the number of choices. Here we've just got two options and we've just got two draws. So we're drawing two marbles and their marbles can either be blue or green, but nothing else. Um, interestingly enough, the probabilities of the branches will always add up to be one, um, and the probabilities of these branches will always add up to be one, and these branches. So anytime you have a node and you have several branches coming out, they have to add up, those probabilities have to add up to be one. So I think that um, that's in interesting. Um, and uh, so that's kind of what that says too. Um, we want to label our branch probabilities on the tree, um, but the, the sum has to be one. Um, and then, really, to complete the tree, we want, um, after this, we want a column for our outcomes. I'm just going to abbreviate that as outcome, out. Um, and we want a column for the corresponding probabilities. So we'd have a column for the outcomes and a column for the corresponding probabilities. I'm kind of running out of room here, but I'll do a little bit of an abbreviated part. Um, so for the first draw, if we've got two marbles, four green and seven blue, that totals to be, hopefully you said 11. Um, so 11 total marbles. Um, and our chance of getting green on the first draw would be 4 out of 11, right? Because we have 4 green out of a total of 11. That's the simple definition form of probability to label that. And that leaves, remember this has to add to be 1, 7 out of 11 for blue. Um, but even if we didn't know that this had to be totaled to 1, we'd have 7 blue and a total of 11, so it makes sense that this is 7 elevenths. And, boom, we got that right. Here's where it gets tricky. We are not told that we're putting these marbles back. And whenever you're not told that you're putting the marbles back, you're going to assume that you're not putting the marbles back. Um, so our four on the first draw, um, on this first draw, assuming that we drew green, um, our four becomes three because we didn't put that green marble back. We have it in our hand. It's not in the bag anymore. So there are only ten total marbles in the bag now, three of which are green. Um, and so this probability becomes 3 out of 10. And that means this probability is 7 out of 10. I'm not going to write that down. Now, what if we're doing down here, because we've got to do down here too. Um, down here, we haven't drawn a green marble. We've drawn a blue marble on our first one. So we still have 4 green, but we have 6 blue. Um, and so uh, we still have 10, by the way. 4 plus 6 is still 10. Um, so now this is going to be 4 um, out of 10, uh, and our blue would be 6 out of 10. And boom, 4 out of 10, 6 out of 10, 3 out of 10, 7 out of 10. Uh, so that's the way we label our tree. These are all from the definition the simple definition of probability is also conditional probability. So this is given the condition that our first draw was what it was, we've determined this probability. So uh, tree diagrams, the second draw is always conditional probability. Um, and that means, because we've got regular probability and conditional probability, that means that we can multiply these two together to get the probability of, um, so we'll say this is GG, our outcome is GG. So if we follow the branches out, we have green, green, and so GG is going to be 4 times 3, um, which we'll say is 12, over 11 times 10, which we'll say is 110. Now you can simplify this, both are even, so you can at least um, divide by 2 uh, and get 6 out of 55, maybe? Um, I'm not sure if you could simplify more than that. I don't think you can. Um, but uh, so you could simplify that fraction. And then this outcome would be GB, and we would multiply 4, ten, four elevenths times 7 tenths to get that. Um, this one would be BG, so you can see that BG is different from GB, although their probabilities are probably identical, most likely identical. Um, And then the last one would be BB. And then when you find all of these probabilities, if you happen to add them together, um, they would be 1. And each of the probabilities would be between 0 and 1. So this is kind of your probability distribution. 
Um, you've listed every possible outcome if you've drawn your tree completely, and you've listed all of the corresponding probabilities. And so now, all you need to do to answer your question, um, and we weren't actually asked a question here, but all you would need to do to answer your question is to add the uh, corresponding probabilities together for the outcomes that meet the question that's being asked. So let's do a question. Uh, this is, I decided, a, a patriotic type of question. Um, it's a little bit different, though. Uh, so really, there are 13 total red and white stripes. Um, but I said, let's do 13 red marbles and 13 white marbles instead of 13 total being red and white. Um, and really, the stars are not blue. They are white on a field of blue, but I've decided to call them blue uh, or represent them with blue marbles at least. And so let's suppose we have 76 marbles total in the bag, 50 plus 13 plus 13 being 76. And we're drawing two marbles out. And here, they told us explicitly we're not putting them back. But even if we hadn't been told that, we would assume that to be true. We want to know the probability of drawing one red and one white. And we don't care about which order it's drawn in. In other words, it could be one red and then one white, or it could be one white and then one red. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go through and we're going to write down what our probability question is, what it what is it asking us, but we're going to use probability notation to do that. Um, we're going to also write down what we were given using probability notation. We're going to consider each and every formula on the formula card, um, and we're going to be willing to use multiple formulas. We're going to have to on this one, uh, and we're going to draw a picture. We're going to explicitly draw a tree diagram to help us answer this. Um, we could have stopped at number four um, and just used multiple formulas, but I find that the tree diagram helps us use multiple formulas without us maybe even realizing what we're doing um, in using the multiple formulas. So first, uh, we're asked for one red and one white regardless of order. Um, and so that could be white and then red, and that's how we represent it that, by the way, just like the GG is green and then green, this is drawing a white marble and then a red marble, and then this is drawing a red marble and then a white marble. And then uh, we want to write down what we're given. And I kind of went a little step further. This isn't explicitly what we were given, but I made some deductions. Uh, so we are told that we have 13 red marbles. We're told that there's 76 total marbles. So I said the probability of drawing red, and this is really only the first draw. The probability of drawing red on the first draw is 13 out of 76. The same is true of white. We were told that we had 13 white marbles, and so the probability of drawing a white marble out on the first draw is going to be 13 out of 76. And then the probability of drawing blue, there are 50 blue marbles in the bag, and so the probability of drawing out a blue marble on the first draw is 50 out of 76. And now we're going to look at each formula on the formula card. And I have already used one of these formulas. As a matter of fact, I have used this formula to identify what we were given. And then uh, another formula that we're going to use, um, we're going to be drawing the tree. And remember that the tree kind of uses conditional probabilities. So it will take the first draw and then assume that what we got on the first draw is what we got and look at the probability of the second draw uh, when we label those um, probabilities that are in our second column or our second trial. And so we will use that formula from the formula card. And then lastly, to put it all together, we're going to add our outcomes together to get the probability of WR or RW. Let me, I didn't realize I'd have to go back so much to do that. Um, but remember, our goal is to find or, and so that's why um, the very last formula that we will use is the OR formula. And that's kind of natural too. Uh, you just find all of the outcomes that match your answer and add those outcomes together. And so here is our tree. Well, we have drawing the first marble out. We will either get red, white, or blue. <laughs> and I represented white with brown instead of white because um, I don't have a white pen and even if I did it wouldn't show up very well on the ivory paper. Um, so red, white, and blue. Uh, and then we've already really talked about the first 
uh, probability. So we have 13 out of 76 to start with red, 13 out of 76 white to start with, and 50 out of 76 blue marbles to start with. And then just like before, our probabilities are going to change. If we assume that we've drawn red, then we no longer have um, 12 red, but we, or, or, I'm sorry, we no longer have 13 red marbles, but we instead have 12, um, and then our total marbles are going to become 75 instead of 76. And so the probability of red would be 12 out of 75. We still have 13 white left, 13 out of 75, and 50 blue left, um, so 50 out of 75. Um, and so that's how we get these first three. And really, we do the same thing uh, down here. Uh, we start, if we assume that white was our first draw, um, then we uh, would still have 13 red, but we would then have just 12 of the white, um, so 13 out of 75, um, and, and of course 75 for the denominator. Uh, 13, 12, and 50. Um, and then down here, if we assume that blue, um, we would still have the 13 and the 13, um, but we would then have 49 for our blue. Um, and so that's how we get all of the probabilities. And then our next step, once we've drawn the full tree and we've labeled all of the probabilities on the tree, our next step is to follow the branches out. Um, so we'll follow the branches out to get our outcomes. Um, so RR is the first set of branches, and then RW, and then RB, and then WR, and then WW, and then WB, and then BR, and BW, and B. B. Um, and so that gives us all nine of our different outcomes that are possible. And in the same way, to get the corresponding probabilities, we will take 13 out of 76 and we will multiply it by 12 out of 75. Um, and that will give us our corresponding probability. Um, that happens to give us this probability. Um, let me... Uh, so 13 out of 76 divided by 12 out of 75. Um, and you could do that here, 13 out of 76, uh, and then times 12 out of 75. And that gives me 0 0.02737 when I round. And I think that's what I did was keep four significant digits because I am going to use, yeah, four significant digits, because I'm going to use this to get the final answer. Um, and then I just keep going for the whole tree. I'm not going to write all that down. Um, but the way I got this answer was I did R, 13 out of 76, times W, 13 out of 75. Um, and when you do that math, um, it's just a little bit different because you have 13 times 13 instead of 13 times 12. So it's just a little bit more. You get 0 0.02965 if you round to four significant digits. And then 13 out of 76 times 50, that's significantly more. 50 is significantly larger than 13. Um, and so you get a significantly larger value here. Um, I happen to keep five significant digits so that uh, I could keep to the same decimal place value so that hopefully my answer would add up to be 1 when I summed all of these probabilities together. Um, though I didn't actually do that. Uh, but it might be 0 0.99999 or it might be 1.00001. Uh, and then WR, this is the last one I'll specifically talk about, WR is likewise 13 out of 76 times 13 out of 75 um, and we get the same answer um, but these are separate things so even though they have the same answers they are not the same thing drawing a white marble out first and then a red marble is not the same as drawing a red marble out first and then a white marble these are two separate outcomes that have equal probability and it makes logical sense that they would have equal probability but at the same time they are very separate outcomes to, so to find the probability of RW or WR, you've got to add these two things together. Um, and that's what we do as our final step, RW or WR. You can't just say that they're both this, and so that's what they're equal to. No, you've got to go to the formula card and see what the formula card says to do when you have the word or. 
um, because these are actually different separate outcomes and, and we can tell they're separate because they're listed separately when we draw the tree. Um, so they're separate outcomes so they have to be dealt with separately so we add these two together. We could subtract off the overlap but there is no overlap whenever we do outcomes in tree probabilities because we've listed each outcome um, is, is completely separate. It's not an event, it's only one unique outcome. So every outcome that we have listed here are the only possible outcomes that we could have and they're each unique. Um, so the, there's only one way to get RR and that's by drawing R first and then drawing R second. And this is the corresponding probability of getting RR, for instance. Uh, so our total answer to the final question is 0 0.059 3-0, or if we wanted to, we could just give three significant digits, so we wouldn't have to give this final zero if we didn't want to. Um, these three are significant. These zeros are placeholders, so 0 0.0593 could be our final answer here. Um, so this is a, a pretty big, complicated probability problem. Not all of the problems you deal with, or maybe not any of the problems you deal with, will be quite this complicated. Uh, but by doing a complicated problem, I think you'll have the tools uh, to use to be able to do any problems that you're presented with. Um, but there's some other tools in your tool belt that I don't want you to forget as well. So as you go about doing the homework um, and the discussions and projects and quizzes that are related to this topic, number one, number one, number one, number one is your formula card. To a lesser extent, your calculator will be useful, um, especially on the expected value questions, but also for arithmetic purposes. Um, your lecture notes will hopefully be very useful to you, especially in the process of how we solve a probability problem. Number one, write your answer in probability notation, then what you're given in probability notation, look at the formula card and, and see which formulas match what you've written down for one and two, um, and be prepared to use multiple formulas, and especially be prepared to use tree diagrams or Venn diagrams. So the, the lecture notes will be particularly helpful to you um, on that score. And then we've only done a couple of examples in this video. Um, we haven't done very much at all uh, because this topic is so uh, broad and important. Um, so be sure to check out the examples in your textbook um, and to check out the examples in the Newton instruction. Um, so I think these, um, more than your calculator, will be particularly helpful in this topic. So do not abandon um, these these two down here. Textbook especially for looking and reading the examples and the Newton instruction. And then if all of these fail, which they may well fail in this chapter, this is a challenging chapter, please, please, please message me um, and send me a screenshot of the problem that you're working on and I will do my best to give you a detailed explanation and breakdown of exactly how you would solve the problem. And I will try to um, abide by the write the answer in probability notation, write the given stuff in probability notation, look on the formula card for the formulas that are appropriate, uh, use multiple formulas if you need to, and use a tree or a Venn diagram if you need to. So I wish you the very best in using all of these tools to master this topic, this challenging, challenging topic, and I appreciate all of your hard work that you've given so far, uh, especially in this chapter. Thank you so much for working hard. Good luck.